there in when we last met for this course, um, uh, we had discussed two things. Um, first, we discussed this a little bit about this non-abelian bosonization paper by Witten. We will come back to that as we as we proceed. Um, uh, I'll just give you a five minute reminder of the context because we're going to get rather technical in this class. So just, just to remind you of the context. Um, when we last met, we discussed this non-abelian bosonization paper by Witten. And uh, in that paper, um, uh, we, we focused on the case of SU2. So um, we discussed the sigma model on, uh, on the SU2 group manifold. Namely, the sigma model on S3. And uh, we recalled that the RG flow formulae on the world sheet of the string, the beta function formulae, the formulae that told us that g mu nu dot del g mu nu by del log lambda was equal to r mu nu. Okay, that formula told us that at least in the one loop approximation, uh, if you start with a sigma model on an S3, that sigma model just shrinks because the r mu nu, uh, the r mu nu of a, a sphere is proportional to g mu nu times a, a negative number. So that just shrinks things. Uh, um, so the r, if you take a sigma model on S3 and you work out its renormalization group flow, because the sigma model has some symmetry, namely uh, SO4 symmetry, uh, and we're preserving that symmetry under renormalization group flow. That symmetry doesn't change. So, you know, it just takes you back to a sigma model on an S3. The one thing that can change consistent with the symmetry is the radius of the S3. And that changes. And the uh, one-loop RG flow equations took that S3 and made it shrink down to zero size at very small, um, uh, at very uh, low energies. And we discussed how, uh, in actual fact, of course, it doesn't really go to zero size. The one loop approximation breaks down. And uh, this theory is gapped. Okay, So sigma model, uh, one plus one dimensional sigma model on S3 is a gapped theory. And seemed disconnected from our attempt to study, um, uh, seemed disconnected from our attempt to study conformal field theories. Right, because a gap theory is not, not a conformal field theory. It's a quantum field theory, but okay. Uh, and uh, we discussed how we can, explained a brilliant way around this, a brilliant way of making sigma models, sorry, conformal field theories out of the sigma model on S3. And uh, uh, this is just a five, 10 minute reminder to remind you of the context then we move on to the real topic of today's class, just because we're meeting after a long time. Okay, and uh, you remember that uh, in the study of sigma models, we had one by one by four pi alpha prime, let's say, I'm using string theory notation. Often people said alpha prime to two. Uh, del x mu del alpha del beta x nu g mu nu and g uh, and g alpha beta. This is a natural sigma model on a, uh, on a two-dimensional world sheet. A two-dimensional uh, in a two-dimensional theory. It describes the propagation of a string on a background metric on a a background metric with background metric g mu nu. And when we discussed the sigma model on S3, what we were discussing was the motion of the string on a background S3. So the g mu nu is the metric of an S3. Okay. But there is another thing that also appears in string theory. Okay. That appears as naturally on the world sheet of the string. And that other thing is plus b mu nu epsilon, epsilon alpha beta del alpha x mu, del beta x mu. Antisymmetric. So this b is antisymmetric in mu and nu, and alpha and beta antisymmetric in alpha beta. Uh, that is why the whole thing is, is non-zero. Okay? That's another thing that naturally appears in the world sheet of the string. And uh, uh, from the point of view of just as a two-dimensional theory, it's a second natural operator that is classically marginal. Because remember, in, in, uh, in a, uh, uh, we're working in the limit where all curvatures and field strengths of this b mu nu are very small 
in units of this alpha prime. Okay, so this is in a, a perturbation around locally the sigma model being sigma model on on R D, where D is the dimensionality of the space. In our case, R three. Okay, so in the sigma model on R three, which is just a theory of free three free scalar fields, the scalar fields have dimension zero. More precisely, the scalar fields are don't have a well-defined dimension, but derivatives of the scalar field have dimension one. Okay? So, if you put two derivatives of the, uh, of the scalar field, one holomorphic and one anti-holomorphic, and that's what this epsilon does. Okay? If you put two derivatives of the scalar field, okay, one holomorphic and one anti-holomorphic, okay, then classically this operator has dimension one comma one. One holomorphic, one anti-holomorphic. Okay, so it's classically marginal, just like this guy was. This guy was also one holomorphic, one anti-holomorphic, because if we work with background metric being eta, in holomorphic, anti-holomorphic coordinates, eta zz is zero, eta z bar z bar is zero, eta z z bar is one or two or half or whatever. Okay, so this also had one holomorphic, anti-holomorphic, also was classically marginal. Uh, classically marginal, but quantum mechanically, you know, it's whatever it is. Okay, and then we discussed how uh, um, uh, when you compute the beta function in such a model, we found that uh, oh, oh, right. Uh, when we compute the beta function in such a model, we found that beta of g mu nu, so del g mu nu by del log lambda. Okay, instead of, there's of course the R mu nu term. Okay, um, uh, there was the R mu nu term, but there was also, now I won't get all the signs right, but something like H alpha beta mu H alpha beta nu, where H was equal to dB, and uh, D is taken in target space. It's the exterior derivative of the two form B. It's the field strength corresponding to the gauge field B. Okay? It means target space, not the Welsh sheet. So this D here means target space D. Okay? So H is a three index object in target space. Okay? Great. And uh, um, uh, uh, again, I'm not getting all the signs right. This probably, for the sphere, this is minus and that is plus. Okay? So when you work uh, when, you, when you work this out now, okay, great. So now there's a possibility, right? There's something negative here, something positive here. These two things can balance each other. Now let's try to continue to work with models that preserve the symmetry of the, of the three-sphere, SO4 invariance. So what we wanted to do is to work with a B mu nu. Okay? We wanted to work with a B mu nu that preserved the symmetry of the three-sphere. Now that sounds pretty hard. Three spheres, three directions. B mu nu has two indices. How is it going to preserve symmetry of three sphere? Sounds impossible. Y you know, this problem has an analog on S2. Consider a normal gauge field on S2. Can you find a gauge field that preserves the symmetry of an S2? A mu, surely not. It's got one index. But physically, we know there are gauge fields that preserve the symmetry of the S2. These are gauge fields which, uh, which make a constant magnetic field on the S2. So you see, the point here is like in that, uh, that point. The point is that not all of the gauge field is physical. The only part of it that's physical is the part that cannot be changed by gauge transformations. So why you cannot make an A mu that preserves the symmetry of the S2, you can make a DA, which is the gauge invariant part of it, that preserves the symmetry of an S2. Okay, because DA has two indices. It's very natural. You try, try to make a DA such that the, the field strength is proportional to the volumes fo volume form on this, on this sphere. Okay, that will preserve the symmetry of the S2. So in the same way here, this action here only depends on the uh, gauge invariant part uh, of B. Why is that? Well, this action only depends on the gauge. And so more, more precisely, if we take B mu nu and we transform it to B mu nu plus D mu 
a chi nu minus d nu chi mu. Hmm. This action doesn't change. The reason it doesn't change uh, goes as follows. Uh, the reason the action doesn't, okay, you can work this out as an exercise. The reason it doesn't change is that if you put that in there, you will see that you can rewrite that term as a total derivative. Uh, yeah, please try it. You can rewrite this term as a total derivative, of, uh, just one second, Rajat. Okay, total derivative on the world sheet. So just in front of your eyes, this, this action here doesn't really depend on B mu nu. It depends on B mu nu up to gauge transformations. And because of that, we don't really care about B mu nu preserving the, the roundness of the S3. It was enough for us if dB, which is the thing that is invariant under this transformation, just two minutes, uh, invariant under this transformation, preserves the roundness of the S3. Now, is there a dB, an H, that preserves the roundness of the S3? Obviously, there is. H proportional to volume form. Okay. Can I quickly, okay, you're gone. Okay, quickly finish what I, what I was saying. Yeah. So, okay. And now, wait, let's take the analogy with, with the gauge field on a two sphere further. If you take the gauge field on a two sphere, well, you can make gauge, gauge fields with magnetic field proportional to volume form. We couldn't make the coefficient arbitrary. It's quantization of the gauge field. Right? You remember why that works, right? You, you can't really work with A because uh, integral B is non-zero in the sphere, and that seems to violate the thing we learned about in, as undergr undergraduates, that there's no B flux, right? That the total flux of B, because it's integral dA, is zero when you shrink it. And we know how that works. We know that if you think of an A, one, not, one A on one patch of the sphere, another A on another patch of the sphere, where they overlap, they don't have to be equal, but they have to be equal after gauge transformation. And that gauge transformation could have a winding number on the S1 of overlap. And that winding number of the gauge transformation measures um, the, fl the flux, because it tells us the difference between A dot, the Wilsonian integral, the whatever, Stokes law integral, A dot DL, evaluated for the North Pole and for the South Pole. And that gives you the total flux. Okay? So in a very similar way, in a very similar way, uh, with the S1 being replaced by an S2, okay, in uh, and a winding number, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar way, okay. Uh, H flux on an S3 or in any three-dimensional compact three-dimensional manifold is necessarily quantized. Yeah, instead of you, um, uh, it, 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 it would go some, uh, somewhat like this. Um, you would have. Um, the instead of winding and uh, a, uh, a, a scalar on a circle, there would be what would it be? Let's think. Uh, let's think. Uh, but winding what? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, it's the gauge transformation law itself has one index. Okay, that's this uh, chi mu, and uh, uh, then we've got that object. Uh, uh, defined on an S2, I think what we would get is this chi mu, we probably get the flux of this chi mu, I would have to check, but I think we'd probably get the, the, the flux of this chi mu integrated on, on S2. Uh, I would have to check that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure now. But for some, some very similar argument gives us that H here is quantized on a three sphere. Okay. Uh, I could work that out and check that for next class. Okay. And uh, therefore, this guy is some integer quantization, okay, times the, vol uh, the volume form on S3. Okay. And now you can imagine that this quantity vanishes, that this quantity vanishes depending at some radius, depending on what, uh, what k is, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, 
very roughly, very roughly, you can think as follows. We've got integral h on this S3 being equal to k. Okay, so the field strength density on S3 is proportional to k divided by r cube because the volume of the S3 is r cube. Okay, um, now we have this h square. <coughs> okay, well, we have this h square. Okay, this h square that is like a density square and so that will go like k square divided by r to the power 6 and maybe what we can do is you know contract this with the g mu nu okay so this becomes like an r okay r was two derivatives okay so it was 1 over r square So you want to balance these two terms against each other if, if you want uh, a zero of the beta function. And so that tells you that r to the 4 goes like k square or r goes like square root of k. Okay? Yeah, and if you want to think of it physically, you think of it like this. The sphere wants to shrink because curvature is trying to make it shrink. But if it shrinks too much, we get huge energy from field strand square. So it's repelled from r equals 0 by field strand square. It's repelled from r equals infinity by curvature. So it finds somewhere in the middle. Okay, at, uh, roughly at square. <coughs> okay. And, okay. So we got, uh, uh, w so at least within one loop perturbation theory, which is valid when k is large. Why is one loop perturbation theory valid when k is large? One loop perturbation theory is valid when k is large because then the sphere radius is also large because the radius goes like square root k. And when the square radius is large, perturbation theory for sigma models is, is uh, the, the, the parameter that is relevant for it is um, <coughs> alpha prime divided by the length scale of variation of the space. Okay, so I should have said here that k, of course, there's some alpha prime in here, and there's only one dimension in this parameter, so square, k square root of alpha prime. So the effective coupling constant for perturbation theory is 1 over square root k. Okay, because it's uh, alpha prime and units, square root alpha prime and units of length scale. Okay. So when k is large, perturbation theory is good. One loop, the computation we've done, uh, done is, is good, and in fact reliable. So at least at large k, large enough k, we've reliably shown the existence of a conformal field theory. Now, um, I mentioned in that class, and we will come back and analyze this in detail after we understand uh, understand the mathematics of these theories better. But uh, I. Uh, mentioned in the last class that uh, basically, you know, uh, an S3 is invariant under SU2 times SU2. SU2. Two ways to understand that. <laughs> Same way, but let me say it in two different ways. The first way is that S3 embedded in R4 clearly has SO4 symmetry, and SO4 is SU2 times SU2. Second way of thinking of it is a little more sophisticated. Okay? It's a little more sophisticated. And the sophisticated way is to, to remind yourself that S3 is actually the group manifold of SU2. Okay? And so, if you've got a group manifold of SU2, and you've got, you know, uh, you do things in a nice way, like using the round metric for your, for your, uh, for your sigma model, you might expect that this uh, that this uh, uh, that this theory here uh, is invariant under both left multiplications of the group and right multiplications of the group, and these are the SU two and SU two. Okay, what we will explain when we come back to the physics of this stuff in more detail is that 
it turns out that the left multiplication SU2 becomes a purely holomorphic, uh, a purely holomorphic symmetry. The current that generates uh, this, this left multi multiplication SU2 is purely holomorphic. And the current that generates a right multiplication SU2 is purely anti-holomorphic. Okay? You know what's interesting, right? The left and right, when I said left SU2 and right SU2, seem to have nothing to do with the well sheet. It was left and right of <laughs> from the sense of group SU2. But they get connected by the equations of portion. We will see that as we go. Okay? And because of that, because we have currents, SU2 currents that are holomorphic, we get current algebra. That is, you remember, right? We expanded JAZ as sum over JAM by Z to the pi M plus 1. And each of these JAMs was a conserved, was a conserved charge. So we immediately multiplied our number of uh, conserved uh, charges from 3 plus 3, which is the SU2 times SU2, to 3 into infinity times 3 into infinity. This came from the holomorphicity. By the way, this holomorphicity, of course, is tightly linked to becoming conformally invariant. So the fact that this current is a holomorphic current would not be true even classically. It's not true just of the sigma model on SU2. But it is true of the sigma model plus this B field. Okay? Great. Uh, so this was our motivation to study theories which have two, two, uh, two aspects to them. Okay. First, that they have non-abelian symmetries associated with currents. You know, so there's a current associated, uh, non-abelian symmetries that are implement whose currents are holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. Okay? And uh, in perhaps the last, very last time we met, we discussed this tight connection between current algebra and the vera soro symmetry. This was called the Sugawara construction. You remember we discussed how this guy, J A of Z, J A of Z divided by kappa, where in the case of SU2, kappa was equal to K plus 2. Yeah, this is all normal order, right. We discussed exactly what this, what this meant, right. You don't contract these two guys together. You remember this calculation was a bit tricky because we did it using an OP, but it was a bit strange because these two guys were on top of each other. So we could legally use an OP between any one of these and something else. So we did some round your head gymnastics, but anyway, we understood it. We looked at a three-point function and so on. Okay, we, uh, you remember that this property had, the, had all the properties of a, of a stress tensor. T of Z was equal to this. Uh, uh, whose uh, central charge was equal to 3k divided by k plus 2. Okay? And we also defined this notion of primary operators. We also defined this notion of primary operators with respect to this current algebra. Primary operators um, by the state operator correspondence corresponded to states that were annihilated by every L lowering, uh, whatever, lowering operator of JM. Every J with uh, positive values of M. Okay? And uh, one other thing that we had discussed, which was sort of important, was that, um, was this second SU2. Does somebody remember this? The SU2 we made out of J minus, minus 1A, J0, J minus 1 plus J0, maybe J minus 1 minus, J0, 0, and J plus minus. You know what I mean? Huh? And that's, so I'll just remind you, so that you see now, because we're looking at SU2 for the moment, there are two kinds of indices. 
There is a which generator index and there is a what level index. What level I mean this M index, this M. This M index. Right? And we looked at let's say J plus I think 1, J minus minus 1 and J 0, 0. And we explained that this itself formed an SU2 algebra. And when we looked at the consequences of the fact that, the, 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 uh, that this formed an SU2 algebra which was unitarily represented. Okay? And in the case of SU2 we showed that that told us that all operators that were unitarily, you know, all unitarily re represented operators had uh, primary operators had j less than, was it k? Or k? k by 2. K. Number of boxes is less than k. So k by 2. j is less than or equal to k by 2. <coughs> right. Uh, and we also went through this Gipner Witten paper. Uh, we also, all, always in the context of SU2, we went through this Gipner Witten paper, the net conclusion of which was the following that correlation functions involving any operator or its descendants that was out of this range, j was out of the range 0 to k, k by 2, correlate of that with anything else always vanishes. Do you remember this? It's a totally remarkable result, totally remarkable. You know, the correlation function of any operator which was out of this, this people sometimes call these guys integrable or unitary represent, uh, representation. So the correlation function of any non-unitary or non-integrable primary and anything else always vanished. Actually, this, this, that gepner witten argument didn't even assume unitarity. It didn't even assume unitarity. It's quite a remarkable, I mean, it's a totally remarkable argument. Every time I look at it, I find myself freshly ama amazed by it. Okay, so it tells you that in these theories, not all representations of SU2 appear. If you've got a representation which is J large, larger than K by 2, all its correlation functions would be 0. So it's not there in the theory. Okay, the Hilbert space of the theory should be composed of just primary, op primary operators, primary representations with j ranging from 0 to k by 2. Okay? So the last round, last time round we went, we got a glimpse of the physics of theories that implement non-abelian symmetries in a holomorphic or anti-holomorphic manner. Such theories uh, represent the so-called Kachmudi algebra. Okay? Now, my plan for, uh, uh, for this lecture and the next few is uh, painful. And if I hear many protests, we'll just zoom through it. Okay? The plan is to review Lie algebra. Okay. So, we went through this for SU2 because that's really familiar. Okay? But everything that I've said has generalizations for arbitrary Lie algebras. Okay? So my plan is in this lecture to remind you, okay, uh, to remind you and to remind myself of elementary Lie algebra theory. Okay, for arbitrary groups. Okay? Then in the next, maybe maybe we'll have to continue this in part of the next lecture. Then subsequently. Uh, we will discuss these Kachmudi algebras in the language of mathematics, in, the lang in a language that makes them look like Lie algebras. Okay? Uh, all of this discussion is painful and not necessarily particularly relevant, but I felt both you and I should see it once. Okay? So two or three lectures with this. These will not be the most pleasant lectures, either for you or for me. I'm sorry, but I thought duty demands it. Okay, okay, uh, 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 and then we will return to physics 
in various ways. OK, so that is the plan for uh, today's, the rest of today's lecture and the next time. First, any questions or comments? Sorry, Rishraj, I shut you up. Sorry. Yeah. So we'll get forward, but why would we be interested in looking at non curvy sigma models in S3? Uh, why were we interested in looking at S3? Uh, OK, S, uh, S3 is just one example. As we will see, uh, we, we can look at uh, nonlinear sigma models on any group manifold. OK? And there is something very similar. So <coughs> S3, from this point of view, was relevant because it happened to be a group manifold, group manifold of, of SU2. SU2. OK? S3, of course, is uh, very nice, right? Because it's a group manifold, but very familiar. All of us can imagine it, to the extent that anyone can imagine curved three-dimensional spaces, but you, know, you can imagine the two-sphere analog of it. It's very nice, it's very familiar. This is why I started with, and also SU2 group is very familiar, okay? But the general principle holds, the, the, general, um, the general thing works in, for any group, as we will see as we come, once my plan is to go through this abstract nonsense, we get a lot of notation Dual Coxter numbers, what the hell is that? Okay, <laughs> you know, things like that. We'll get a lot, <laughs> we'll learn a lot about that kind of stuff. <laughs> There's the sum of the dual uh, weights. Exactly, now what are dual weights? Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. So we'll learn a lot of nonsense, and <laughs> then we will uh, come back more generally to more general group manifolds at some point. We'll look at cosets, we'll do all kinds of fun stuff, uh, but, uh, once we should go through this stuff properly. Okay, if, you, if I hear any very loud protests, okay. <laughs> is formalism entirely based on Lie Is generalization of Lie group theory. Uh, after we understand things based on, you know, group manifolds, we'll also look at cosets. So we will not limit ourselves just to looking at sigma models on group manifolds, but those will be the first example. Is the question, is the answer clear? Yes. Also, what did you mean when you said uh, that uh, left SU2 and right SU2? Okay, let me say it again. Let me say it again. You know, let me say it more clearly. I wrote down the sigma model on, S, on S3 in this form, where you put in, you choose your favorite coordinates, and in those coordinates, you write down the round metric of S3 in those coordinates. For instance, we could use a Hopf basis. You know, Think of a Hopf vibration on S2 or whatever. Just you choose your favorite coordinate size. It doesn't matter. That's how I wrote it down. Okay. But SU2, S3 is also the SU2 group manifold. Okay. So now we should be able to write down this sigma model in a more abstract way. Okay. So let me write it down in a more abstract way. Consider trace G inverse del mu G. G inverse del mu G. <coughs> Maybe I want. Maybe I want the other way around. Yeah, I think probably want this. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, D D two x. I'm just writing down the sigma model, not writing down the way some you written. Dumb. Just the sigma model. Okay. Now what does trace mean? Well, trace you know, right? Imagine that this G is a matrix and rep some representation. Let's say the two cross two representation. Okay? And trace is just trace in that representation. Okay? Nice thing about Lie groups is that if you take the trace in any representation up to a proportionality constant, you get the same thing. Okay? So you can choose whatever representation you want, that will change this number we put behind here. But we understand what this means. Okay, now let's look at the following. Let's take G goes to alpha G beta, where alpha and beta are constant SU2 matrices. Because every G inverse is followed by a G, the derivatives don't matter because it's constant. Everything cancels. Can you see that? Right, because then G inverse goes to beta inverse, G inverse, alpha inverse. Now just plug that in. 
the beta inverse, beta kills the beta inverse, uh, and there's the trace. Cancels everything out. cancels out. Because of the cyclicity of the trace, everything cancels out. So you see that this sigma model has a symmetry. Okay? This is very abstract. Uh, this symmetry says that there is a symmetry if we make that variable change, alpha g beta. Clear, Rajat? Okay. Now this I'm going to call alpha beta. So far, constants, constant matrices. But alpha and beta need not have anything to do with each other. It's the symmetry for any alpha and any beta. I will call this SU2 left because it corresponds to multiplying the group element from the left with alpha. And I will call this SU2 right because it corresponds to multiplying the group element from the right. So you see that the sigma model has a symmetry under SU2 left times SU2 right. Okay? <laughs> now if we were working with just the sigma model, that's it. That's how it would end. How do we see this fact? In this description, in this description we see this fact very simply because S3 has an SO4 isometry, which is SU2 left times SU, S, SU2 times SU2. One of those two is SU2 is SU2 left, the other is SU2 right. No, but why is the SU2 left here corresponds to the same SU2 left here? Meaning, you know, both of them are the same theory. So they have the same symmetries. So here you see it in this language. There you see it. Now you could of course also write, you could write it down. You know, you could parameterize a general group element. Uh, you could parameterize a general group element by two cross two matrix, a uh, two cross two unitary matrix. And just take this, write it down in terms of, met, you know, a G menu. In that parameterization, you get an effective metric. You can check that those are the same. But it had to be, right? Because it's the same model. It has to have the same symmetries. Just two different ways of writing the same thing. Okay? If you get SU2 times SU2 here, you should get SU2 times SU2 there. It's just a different way of writing it. Both ways we see it. What was not clear, and in fact what was not true in the sigma model, was that this left and right had anything to do with left moving and right moving on the well sheet. In fact, in the sigma model, this is a symmetry only for constant matrices. But the when we add the Wessemina Witten term, this H field, the effective currents that generate the symmetry turn out to be holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. That is something we will say as we go along. That is not meant to be obvious. Can I gauge this left and right? Um, can you gauge this left and right? Uh, you mean locally gauge it? Yeah, yeah, you'd have to introduce a gauge field. Uh, yeah, you could do that. You could do that. But you know, gauge fields. Yeah, okay. Now, gauging these things. Okay, good. Um, if you gauged completely, you would end up with an empty theory. You see, gauge fields in two dimensions don't by themselves carry degrees of freedom. Okay? And by if you gauge this thing completely, you just remove everything in the theory. If you did a local gauging. Because by gauge transformations, then you could set G to 1. Okay? And you would just make, get an empty theory. However, we will come back to this. The cosette construction of Wesumino Witten theories involves a partial gauging. gauging. So famous gauging is, for instance, SU2 mod U1. SU2 gives, a, gives us a theory with a three-dimensional space. You take away a U1, you're left with a two-dimensional space. You will see, we will see details, but this two-dimensional space, you're choosing the U1, well, the, yeah, choosing the U1 appropriately, this, uh, this uh, basically co coordinating left and right, this U1 will become a cigar. And uh, this is a famous theory, this. Cigar conformal field theory that finds many uses, two dimensional black holes, for instance. Okay? So, partial gauging often gives us useful things. And partial gauging is a cosette, is what you're doing. You're removing, modding out by the stuff you don't want to keep. Okay? Excellent. Yes? Excellent. 
other dimensions <coughs> will not have this. Nonetheless, it will always be possible to find some h. Okay, that is basically uh, tuned to three cycles of the group manifold. Okay, the description will be more abstract than this. It will be. So let me tell you how Witten words it, but we will see it in many different ways. Uh, the way Witten worded it was, was as follows. He worded this, um, uh, uh, this, this, uh, um, uh, this extra term in the following language. Again, we will see this in more detail, but, uh, but the way he worded it was this. He wrote down a three form Okay, on the world sheet. Okay, here we were talking about three forms on target space. But he wrote down a three form on the world sheet that was manifestly group invariant. Now you think, what, what do you mean by three form on the world sheet? Because it, there are only two directions. What he did then is to imagine that the world sheet is the boundary of a three manifold. Okay? And he integrated that three form on the boundary of that, uh, that, that, uh, that manifold. Now you're thinking, look, this is totally crazy, right? Because then we're not dealing with a two-dimensional conformal field theory. We're dealing with three dimensions. However, Witten, in fact, I could write that down for you. Let, in, in a minute, I'll write it down for you. But let me say the point first. Uh, Witten chose that three form, world sheet three form to be a total derivative. Okay? I'll tell you exactly what total derivative is in a minute. But he chose it to be a total derivative. And therefore, it didn't, sin since we're integrating it on, the, on a three-dimensional, uh, meaning D of something. Okay? He, he chose it to be D of something. And therefore, when we're integrating on this three-manifold by whoever's theorem, Stoke, Gauss, whatever, you get just only the boundary matters. But, you see, suppose you take your, th your, your world sheet as an S2. Now you could fill out the S2 inside, or you could fill out the S2 outside. The outside is more clear if you think of the S2 as being an equator or an S3. Then you could fill out the S2 by closing the S3 here or here. Okay? And since nobody's told you how you should fill it out, it had better be that both ways of filling it out give the same physics. Now, Witten's three, three, four, okay, uh, which was manifestly group invariant, by the way. I mean, that is the point, right? That was what was worrying you. Yeah. Uh, we, it was manifestly group invariant. Yes, Witten's three form was had the property that it was integrated to an integer on any three cycle. I'll tell you why in a minute. But first, let's get the logical structure. Therefore, if you choose units so that your action is e to the power i times 2 pi times um, this integral, then two different ways of filling it out differ by the integral of this total derivative on a three manifold Okay, which I told you was al always an integer. And then if you choose the coefficients correctly, so that it's i 2 pi in the path integral, you get the same answer no matter which way you fill it out. Okay, and that in integrality, okay, that k is in the case of SU2 the same as the quantization of th three dimensional flux. Okay. So there is a an abstra, uh, there is a generalization of it, which is a group invariant three flux, which we will describe. Yeah, but it's a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, okay, I promised I would tell you what this was a total derivative of. Uh, let me say it in words, then we can go into equations if you are interested. You know, in the case of SU two, it's really simple. Everything is simple for SU two. You see, because when the world sheet quote unquote world sheet we're working with is a three dimensional manifold. Because we had that this, this fake world sheet is a three dimensional manifold. And target space is also three dimensional. 
And now, <coughs> if you write down the Jaco <coughs> so this maps are maps from a 3D space to a 3D space. Okay? If you write down, so to speak, the Jacobian <coughs> of this transformation. Okay? Integrating that over the whatever metric you put on your false th 3D space will tell you the volume of embedding in target space. <coughs> okay? And this thing, if you integrate over the whole space, <coughs> normalizing by the volume of that whatever in target space, will give you the winding number. <coughs> the number of times this your target space three sphere, the number of times your map winds the target space three sphere as it goes once around the world sheet three sphere. Okay? That's why you get an integer. Okay? Similarly, in, or in uh, other groups, so more general groups, you will be doing this for three cycles. We will come, come back to all that later on. Okay? That's. Yeah, yes. As you do both are spheres to spheres. <laughs> yeah, you've seen an analog of this before. Uh, seen an analog of this before, but you know, it's sort of like, you know, you've seen, when, when you guys studied instantons, let me remind you, instantons, let me re re remind you what an instanton is. An instanton is a gauge configuration that has finite action in Euclidean space. Okay? Now the only way, sorry, we're going off topic, but since you passed. Okay. Uh, the only way a, a map from Euclid, a Euclidean map from R4 to target space, I'm looking at instant tons in three plus one dimension field. Only way a map from R4 to group manifold, uh, sorry, to, to, ga ga to, to ga gauge field, gauge field, to, uh, what we want is, you know, AMU as a function of X. R4 to gauge field configurations. The only way it can have finite action is if at infinity it becomes pure gauge. Otherwise, you keep piling up action, right? So the only finite action configurations like this, at infinity become pure gauge. Infinity is an S3. So instantons then are maps from S3 into group manifold. Exactly. The maps from S3 into group manifold, evaluated by pi 3. But you know that there are instantons in SUN theory. Mm. That already tells you the pi 3 of SUN is non-trivial. And uh, is integer valued. It's the same factor as usual. Uh, in that language, in that context, it's instanton number here. It's, you know, putting in this three flux. Freeform flux. So we use those, those pi threes. You know, basically what happens is that there's an SU2 inside the SUN and you wind around that. And then that can be rotated. Anyway. Okay. Uh, you can smooth it around. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Any other questions? Just any other questions or comments about the general, uh, the general uh, motivation and the reason we're going to torture ourselves for the next few, next few lectures. Okay, all good. Okay, let's let's go. Oh yes, compact Lie groups. Uh, you know, as you know, and that's a very interesting subject. As you know, SL two R, Westphalian Witten theory on the group SL two R is very important because it gives you the theory for ADS three. As you know. And as you know, even SL2R representation theory by itself, you know, is very is strikingly different from SU2 representation theory. Yeah. All, all unitary representations are infinite dimensional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some of these representations don't even have lowest weights. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as you know, uh, gets even more complicated when you look at uh, uh, current algebra. 
And uh, as you know, these complications were masterfully wrestled with by Maldasena Anuguri, who completely understood that structure. So if you guys want, we could have a, a lecture on the Maldasena Anuguri papers. That would give you a flavor of what happens with non-com. I don't think anyone has worked out a general theory of general, general non-compact Lie al Li algebras. But this would be one example. SL2R. On for instance, one of the things that happens, as you know, is that there is no particular reason for K to be quantized mm. in, uh, in, uh, uh, in these SL2R. Uh, yeah, so OK, that's a good idea. At some point, let's have a lecture or two on Maldasena Aguri, preferably by somebody else. One of you can volunteer to, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, to give it. Three papers, yeah. And what about the, uh, the group and the grouping as you work on a QR point in mm, Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, so why has, has that been studied? And not, not to my knowledge. Um, Interesting, right? You might think that that would be relevant for strings in flat space, but it's not. The currents that generate SOD transformations in flat space are not holomorphic. You might think, okay, I'm lying, right? Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not lying. Um, it has to do with the zero modes. Um, yeah, you know, this X by itself doesn't completely factorize into left mover and right mover. Del X does, but X does not, and the path that does not factorize is the zero mode. There's a zero mode which is, there's no natural way to assign it to left or right mover. Now, if you work out the Notha charge for SOD rotations, it's angular momentum, right? So it's X mu P nu minus X nu P mu. P mu is fine. But it's the x mu that causes the problem. That x mu has this zero mode. It doesn't factorize nicely into left and right movers. So no, uh, there is no, strings in flat space do not implement uh, current algebra for, uh, for SO uh, 3 comma 1. Okay? This is why ADS3 is so nice. You know, ADS3 in, some, in that sense is nicer than flat space because the symmetry algebra is elevated to a current algebra. Now, but your question is a very good one. Is there really no way of making a theory with that? I've not seen anyone do it, but you know. What SO3 comma 1. Poincare, I mean, he was not even Poincare, he was talking about Minkowski. Now, of course, we should really do Minkowski plus Poincare. I mean, Poincare, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah. Minkowski. Poincare. Lorenz plus translations. <laughs> translations, translations, we've got nice currents, right? Just del X. Huh. So we have nice currents, holomorphic currents for the translations. It's the rotations that are the issue. And it's sort of incredible, right, that in flat space what doesn't work works in ADS3. Yes, that's amazing, isn't it? Maybe one can take a flat space limit of ADS3. Yes. Why this would even be useful for flat? Because SO3, that means the target space is not flat, right? SO3, is not flat. Um, but... We want the target space to be R3, Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, we want our target space to be R3, comma 1. And you're right that R3, comma 1 is not the group manifold of SO3, comma 1. That is what you're saying. Okay. But you might have hoped that since it implements the, sym the symmetry, you could think of it in some way as some sort of coset. You know, for instance, SO6, as S5, is not the group manifold of SO6. Okay, but it has SO6 symmetry. And often in such situations you can think of these things, these spaces, as cosets of SO6, you know. Yeah, so you might have thought there would be some way to recover, but it's a good point, but some way to recover a holomorphic, holomorphic currents for this symmetry. That does not work here, but works for 
ADS3, where the isometry group is implemented by holomorphic cards. That is really what I wanted to say. So the isomer, uh, uh, isometry group, yeah, I think it's related, of course, to Omkar's point that basically ADS3 is by itself a group manifold. I mean, that at technical level is what is happening. But still, you know, maybe we could take a flat space limit of ADS3. Number of generators in ADS3 is 3 plus 3, 6. Number of generators in R3 is 3 Lorentz and 3 translations, also 6. Some flat space limit. I don't, maybe there's something to do. Yeah. Uh, okay, but I think excellent question and discussion. Okay, <laughs> any other questions or comments? Okay, let's go. Let's not delay it further. Huh? Okay. So let's very quickly remind ourselves for how, uh, uh, how Lie algebras work. I'm uh, going to try to go through chapters 13 and 14. 13 is on ordinary Lie algebras and 14 is on affine Lie algebras of this big yellow book. Uh, okay. So first you remember, of course, what Lie algebras are. They are the infinitesimal symmetry generators. Okay. Uh, so let's call these symmetry generators x, y, z. Okay. Uh, and you remember that Lie algebras are characterized by their uh, by their commutator. X commutator y is equal to some. Okay, let's call this x a commutator x b is equal to f a b c x c. This is the basic uh, characterization of a Lie algebra. Okay, this you remember. Now, given a Lie algebra, okay, one other thing is that Lie algebras, these, these generators obey the same algebraic properties as matrices do. Okay? Uh, they obey the same algebraic properties that matrices do. Now, if you have three matrices, A, B, and C obey this Jacobi identity. Yeah, a commutator, B commutator, C, plus C commutator, yeah, A commutator, B plus. That statement is not some, some deep statement. It's a statement of opening it out. You open this thing out, and you get terms cancelled term by term. Some triviality, right? Okay? So we demand that these guys also obey the same identity, which in representations of these guys is, is a triviality. Okay, so we demand that, uh, that's another way of saying that these guys can be represented by matrices. That's basically that statement. Okay, so we have this Jacobi identity. This, you all know. Anyone wants me to write this down or you're familiar? Right? Everyone's familiar. Okay, excellent. So we've got this, uh, the, these guys have this Jacobi identity. Now let's follow this guy's conventions. I'm, there are eyes and these he calls his things up. I'll just write down. This guy's conventions are uh, yellow book conventions. F I F A B C X. <coughs> okay. Now, the next step in the usual analysis of Lie algebras is to take a maximal commuting set of Lie algebras. Okay. So, whatever your Lie algebra is, we will find. Uh, a maximal commuting set of operators, and we'll call these HI. So, just to remind you, uh, suppose we were doing SU2, then because of the commutation relations are what they are, no two generators commute with each other. So, the maximal commuting set is one dimensional, and we often choose it to be JZ. What about if we were doing SUN? Let's try UN first. If we were doing UN, We've got n across n matrices. Okay. Now, if you choose a maximal commuting set, they can be simultaneously diagonalized by unitary transformations. But in this case, will be just un transformations. They can be simultaneously diagonalized. So maximal commuting set is that of diagonal diagonal matrices. And so there are n of them. First eigenvalue non-zero, second eigenvalue non-zero, and so on. In SUN. In SUN, 
all these n are not independent because S u n is de defined by the set of uh, matrices which have zero trace. The zero trace condition removes one of them. So S u n, you can find n minus one such guys. Okay. So so the di the dimensionality of this Cartan basis is a very important property of Lie algebras. Okay. So let's call that the dimensionality of H. H i is equal to 1 for SU2, is equal to n minus 1 for SUN. Um, what about for SON? Somebody? All of you know this. Say it, somebody say it. Huh? n by 2, almost. n by 2 if, if n is even. <laughs> All right. So n minus, uh, n, n, but n by 2 integer. This, this symbol sometimes is greatest integer, no greater than. Yes. So for SO3, it would be 1. SO4, it would be 2, and so on. SO5, it would be 2, and so on. OK. Uh, how do you see that, somebody? How do you see this physically? n by 2 additive. Excellent. Excellent. So SON can be thought of as rotations in n-dimensional space. And you make two planes. Rotation in each of the two planes commutes with each other. And so if there are you're in six dimensions, you have three cartons, three two planes, and so on. Uh, and then all, all groups that are not SUN or SON are too complicated to talk about. <laughs> OK? This SPN, that's a horrible thing, right? OK, let's not talk about SPN. And then there are these E8 and E6 and E7. Uh, but OK, fine, we'll come to this. Great. So. Cartan basis we understand, <laughs> dimensionality of Cartan basis we understand, right? Uh, you know, part of the point of all this is that everything we've discussed for SU2, and we're, we're going to go back very quickly and write down the generalizations for general groups, just so that you know. Uh, this number is called the rank of the group. This number is called the rank of the group. There you go. Rank. And the number of generators is sometimes called dimensionality. Dimensionality. Dimension. The dimension of the layer. There you go. Excellent. Now, let's say we've chosen a particular Cartan subalgebra. These HIs, they commute with each other and they form a commuting subalgebra. Okay? We've chosen a particular Cartan subalgebra. There's no, you know, you could choose JZ or you could choose JX, JYs. You choose some, make some choice and stick with it. OK, presumably all choices are equivalent under group rotation. I think that's probably true. OK, now you, you, you choose this Cartan subalgebra. You stick with it. And uh, OK, now the next thing we're going to do is this. We're going to think of, we're going to think of, we're going to immediately discuss a particular representation of this algebra. The particular representation is sometimes called the adjoint representation. And is given by this quantity itself. Okay? So imagine that we've got a vector space. The vector space are, are, is the vector space of generators. And then we act on this vector space by another generator. Okay? So we think of this as the vector. And this is the operator. OK? So sometimes to make this clear how I'm thinking, I will write this as J A acting on ket J B is equal to I F A B C ket J C. That's what this is here. But this action, because we want to separate one as the thing on which is act, it's being acted, and the second is the operator, sometimes you want to think of this in this language, in this particular case. Uh, and then we get, we found the representation matrices in this particular representation. The matrices that represent the operator A are I, F, A, B, C, where B, C are the matrix indices. That's clear? OK? And of course, these J's obey Jacobi identity. 
So these representation matrices obey Jac Jacobi identity. Okay, and that is, can be thought of as a constraint on poss uh, possible Fs. That's clear? Great. Now, what we're going to do is we've got an operator acting in a set of vectors. We're going to, uh, we're going to try to die. Uh, we are trying to. We're going to try to find uh, a basis of these vectors, in which, uh, uh, in which, uh, our H's thought of as operators. Okay. So our Cartana, uh, uh, Cartana objects thought of as operators are represented diagonally. Okay. So we're going to try to find a basis. Look for basis. basis of JB, okay, such that HI on vector JB is equal to, uh, let's call it uh, alpha BI, I'll use capital letter here so that, alpha BI on JB, okay. This is true for all B and all I. I'm going to look for such such a basis in my vector space. Of course, this vector space is just a space of generators. But just to remind you, uh, yeah, fine. Um, uh, by the way, there's, just to say, there's also a natural inner product of this vector space, which is trace. These guys are some matrices, the matrices I've got here, and the inner product is like a trace. Right? Trace on matrices gives you an inner product, uh, uh, inner product on vectors. Okay, maybe trace with of object with star. But okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, now we've got this. Uh, we've got these. These uh, we're looking for these guys, and immediately you realize that the vectors corresponding to H i themselves of course, have zero eigenvectors. Because we, you remember, by definition, hi with hj was equal to zero, which in this language tells us hi with, uh, on vector hj, is equal to zero. So the, so we've already found some of our, uh, our, our, uh, our, our eigenstates that are diagonal, that are, have definite eigenvalues under hi, namely those corresponding to hj. And of course, we can use any basis because zero eigenvectors. We can we'll choose any basis we want. Yeah. Uh, some other is saying that we have to finish up in ten minutes. Okay, we'll finish in ten minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so, but what about the rest? Okay, now let's suppose that we've got a character. I mean, a fellow. Let's call it E. Okay, I've diagonalized it. Whatever I get, I get some diagonal values. So let's say that for this guy, I get is equal to, so I'm labeling my non-zero eigenvectors by their eigenvalues, as we normally do in quantum mechanics. Okay, so is alpha i on E alpha. This E alpha is like a collection of numbers, one, two, Rank one to rank of group. So I'm labeling my non-zero my my eigen my eigen vectors with with definite eigenvalues by the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are alpha one to alpha d. D is the rank. Okay, and so if I act with h i on e j, I get alpha i on e alpha j. This is just notation. Right? Whatever my uh, eigen vectors with definite eigenvalues are. They have some eigenvalues, I call them alpha i. I this is some notation. Okay. But remember that this was secretly h i e alpha j was equal to alpha i e alpha j. That's what this meant. Now, um, okay. Now, we're going to choose these h i's to be Hermitian, to be self-adjoint. 
if there were two H's that were not Hermitian, we take the you know, H i plus H i dagger and H i mm, i times H i minus H i dagger. We move to a Hermitian basis. Okay? So we choose these so that this, uh, these alpha i's will be real numbers. Okay, so these are, these are uh, uh, Hermitian. Now I take dagger of this. Dagger does two things. Okay, it interchanges order and it daggers each of these. But H i dagger by definition is a, a was by convention was H i. This guy is E alpha j dagger. Because the order has been interchange, if I want to re-interchange it, because it's commutator, I pick up a minus sign. And so I get H i commutator E alpha j dagger is equal to minus alpha i E alpha j. A dagger. Exactly. Clear? And therefore, if alpha j appears in a set of roots, minus alpha j also appears in a set of roots. Uh, sorry, I'm using the word root too early. <laughs> a set of eigenvalues. <laughs> if alpha j appears in a set of eigenvalues, alpha minus alpha j also appears in a set of eigenvalues. Uh, and so, we have all eigenvalues appearing in pairs with plus minus alpha j. Okay, so we have E alpha j and E minus alpha j or dagger. Same thing. Clear? Please. Are you saying that H is Hermitian? I mean, that was another mistake. You cannot always go to Hermitian. We are looking at. Uh, good. We're looking at these compact Lie algebras which always admit unitary representation. Now, now you want to know how, how do I know that? Um, this is because there is an inner product which is positive definite. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but how did I know that? I think, yeah, how did I know that? This was how much have I assumed, how much have I proved? Uh, I'm certainly assuming that this thing ha admits, I mean for now what I'm doing is this, that, that assuming that all that the representations are uh, uh, unitary representations. That it's possible to find a, a set of uh, uh, unitary matrices, uh, uh, you know, Hermitian matrices that represent the Lie algebra. Now, uh, what is the proof for this? What is the proof for this? Let me think. Mm, let's see. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, but uh, um, I, I think Omkar will ask if, uh, if I give you SUM, yeah, how do I know that that is true? Because in simple cases we can just check it. Yeah, as a unitary. Yeah, uh, but there's some probably some mathematical characterization of it being compact, compact and semi semi simple. Uh, what? Killing form is trace, basically, right? They define it more compl complicatedly, yeah. This compactness, uh, I mean, yeah. allows to give Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, I think the, uh, the, the point is that from a more abstract characterization, this, uh, these generators will be vector fields on the space on the group manifold. Okay? And uh, there some group manifolds will, uh, will admit a group G invariant positive definite matrix. Okay, and then these vector fields then have a positive definite inner product, and then from that you'd be able to prove that at least the adjoint representation is unitarily represented. I think that is there will be. I, I'm not familiar with it, but I think you would be able to proceed in that direction. Uh, it would be basically the metric on the group manifold, whether it's positive definite or not, because that will feed into the inner product. I think it would be basically that. Okay, but a good question. I, I've never thought, uh, thought that through myself. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So now what we've got is we've taken our generators and we've made them, we've got these e EIs, we've got E alpha J, and we've got E minus alpha J. Okay. 
Now, next question we're going to ask is this. What can we say about E alpha j, E minus alpha j? I'm writing this commutator, uh, but of course we can also write it in cat notation. Okay, so first what can, what can we say about this? First thing that is totally obvious, okay, I hope, let's get through this derivation then we'll go. <laughs> exactly. This thing commutes with all H's. How do you know that? Because, Jacobi identity, yes. Oh, you know, uh, the charge under HI was alpha I of this and minus alpha I of this. So the charge of the product is zero. Okay, so it's sort of clear that it commutes with all HIs. You could prove it from Jacobi identity. Okay, but it's clear, right? Okay, so therefore this thing must be some, ob some object in the Lie algebra that commutes with all H's. And therefore it must take the form C i H i for, uh, for, for some C i. It lives itself in the Cartan subalgebra. Now we can ask, okay, can we, um, uh, can we figure out what form, what are these CIs? Okay, not so difficult. Uh, let's to start with, you know, we've got this inner product, right? This inner product, which is this trace or this killing form, whatever, but in representations, it's just trace. Let's, so far, we've not said anything about how we've normalized all our, uh, all our uh, generators, okay? We know that generators with different eigenvalues will be orthogonal to each other under, under, under inner product, as is always the case in quantum mechanics, okay? What we don't know is what the generators with, what, what the inner product between various HIs are, because they all have same eigenvalues. And we don't know what the uh, inner product of uh, uh, of uh, uh, E alpha with itself, which is e, uh, trace of E alpha E minus alpha, what that is. Okay, so let's choose some conventions. Let us choose. So by the way, these E alphas are basically same as these J plus and J. Plus. Exactly. So in SU two, I should have said that. Thank you. Uh, in SU two, there are three. Uh, there are three generators. There's J plus, J minus, and uh, uh, the Cartan was JZ. There, there was only one, the rank was one. So the eigenvalues was just measuring eigenvalue under, uh, under JZ. And E alpha was, let's say, J plus had plus, and J minus had minus, and you're familiar with the fact that J plus and J minus are daggers of each other, right? So, uh, uh, okay, how much time do, uh, do, uh, do okay, let's, let's, let's quickly, uh, yeah, huh? let's quickly, let's quickly finish this. Okay, uh, okay, excellent. Uh, so now, what we're going to do, and we may change the normalization in two minutes, but let's to start with, let's choose in the space of zero, zero eigenvectors, H i H j, let's diagonalize with respect to inner product. Okay, so when I write trace, I mean inner product, okay. Trace is inner product, same thing. Uh, this, I'll choose this to be delta h. Achha, okay, I think we should, Samadhan is popping in. Uh, let me tell you what I'm going to do. We'll finish it next time. Um, uh, we we write we make a, no, a normalization for this, and similarly, at the moment I will choose trace e alpha i trace e minus alpha i is equal to say one. We'll choose a different normalizer, one over two by mod alpha squared later on. Okay, so meaning a delta I, I j. Right, different eigenvalues are orthogonal, that we know. Let's say we choose this to be one. We'll later choose something more convenient, okay? Then what we do is now, we take this object and take, um, uh, take this object and uh, I, I will choose, a, a I will take a commutator, I will choose a, co co let me do it next time, okay. Uh, take trace of HIs and uh, then to take commutator of this, take trace yes. and we get, we'll figure out what these CIs are. But let me do this next time. In this side, it will be delta H, it will be just CIs and 
Exactly. Exactly. So as he said, basically what we do is this. We take this. Let's say we take Hm. And we take Hm here. And we take trace. OK. On this side, what we get is, as Pavitran said, this is Cm. Because we chose our, normali our normalization. We're projecting onto that state. OK. Now what we do is to evaluate this quantity. We evaluate this using Jacobi identity. Okay, or cyclicity of trace, cyclicity of trace. Okay, we'll be able to manipulate this to become HM commutator E this times this. Okay, we'll be able to manipulate this to be trace of maybe some minus sign I'm getting wrong. Uh, we'll do it properly next time, but E minus alpha. Okay, but this by definition was alpha m. And then that clicks, uh, jare. Uh, and the, 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 this guy, this trace gives you just one, because we chose that. So with this choice, we get alpha m is cm, roughly speaking. OK? And so OK, good. So now we've done this. You fill in the details. So what we've figured out is with this normalization, we have uh, hm e alpha, hi e alpha j is equal to alpha i times e alpha. OK, so you see, we figured out the commutation relations. The, the, sorry. e minus alpha i is equal to alpha i h i. So we figured out the non-trivial commutators between e alpha i's and e minus alpha i's. All that remains is to figure out the commutators between E alphas and E j's, which are not equal. We come back to that next time.